Hello, and welcome to Power Problems, a podcast from the Cato Institute, where we offer a skeptical take on U.S. foreign policy and discuss today's big questions in international security with guests from across the political spectrum. I'm Trevor Thrall, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. And I'm Emma Ashford, a research fellow here at Cato. Today, we discuss Trump's new strategy for Afghanistan. Our guest is Samir Lawani, a senior associate at the Stimson Center, where he is the co-director of their South Asia program. Samir, welcome. Thank you for having me. Great to have you. Um, so let's start, as usual, with the news, and let's start with North Korea. Uh, looks like they've developed a hydrogen bomb and a miniaturized nuclear warhead uh, capable of fitting on an ICBM. Um, Trump's tweeting, talking's not the answer. Uh, maybe Mattis says we could still talk. Uh, tensions rising, sabers rattling. Where, where is this going? Well, I think the U.S. has run out of um, coercive options, let's say. Uh, you know, I was reading an article from a couple colleagues, uh, Ankit Panda and Vipin Narang, uh, and basically they sort of ran through sort of the, the general strategies that exist. There's a de- denuclearization through compellence or force. That seems to pretty much be off the table, uh, given that the you know, the North Koreans have the ability to strike the U.S. homeland directly and hold, a, hold our cities at risk, or at least a city at risk. Um, sanctions uh, don't seem to be slowing down their nuclear program, so they could uh, you know, pressure the regime to a degree, but they really don't have much teeth without China, and China has a very sort of tricky balancing act to play. Diplomacy is sort of, uh, at least right now, doesn't seem to be an option just because we've sort of spent ourselves through on that, and there's not really a lot of mutual trust. Um, so we're basically at the stage where we have to start practicing deterrence, which means trying to hold each other's what we most value at risk and hope that that works. It's a little concerning, though, that the the Trump administration and perhaps some allies in, in Asia don't seem to quite be there yet on the deterrence thing. They still seem to think that there are a course of options that will work, right? Not just diplomacy, but sanctions. So there was a discussion, I believe, the uh, South Korean premier met with Vladimir Putin the other day, tried to convince him to cut off North Korea's oil imports, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, on the basis, well, maybe that'll make them give up their nuclear program. But that seems just incredibly unlikely. And so it seems like most policymakers haven't quite accepted that those options are, are not really going anywhere yet. Yeah. And and then just today, I was reading that the Trump folks are, are looking into getting authorization to go um, yeah, take out North Korean ships that are, mm. and and you're thinking, what what's that all about? And and you have you know our UN ambassador saying that North Korea is begging for war. I, I really don't think they see North Korea yeah. as deterrable, and that's a that's a terrifying. I mean, maybe they're not, which is very terrifying. But right. it's almost just as terrifying if our own administration doesn't think they're deterrable. Yeah, so. that's very concerning. I, it seems to me that I think sometimes we conflate things that are supposed to be demonstrations of North Korean capability as necessarily offensive when, you know, they, they, there's dual use there. So, I mean, it's possible that they could be used for offensive operations, but it's also possible that they're trying to ensure regime survival. And I think disaggregating the two is going to be a real challenge for us. Yeah, ongoing topic for sure. All right, uh, bad actor number two. Let's let's switch to <laughs> Iran. Um, so on the one hand, uh, the UNIAEA recently said that uh, it looks like Iran is complying with the terms of their side of the deal, the JCPOA. Uh, but obviously, the Trump administration is not convinced. And most recently, we had Nikki Haley giving a speech at AEI um, on Tuesday where she, she made it clear that compliance really isn't even the whole objection and that they might, the Trump administration, blow this thing up even if they are complying. Well, I mean, what's, what's going to go on? What's happening? You know, the, the fact that we just shifted from talking about North Korea, where now we have to rely on deterrence because we have no other options, and now we're talking about Iran, where we had other options, we actually put those other options into effect. Those other options are working in preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, and yet the Trump administration or certain elements in it seem to be driving at actually trying to end that deal is frankly baffling to me. You know, I know other people have different opinions on this, but it just doesn't seem to make any sense that we would shift from a point of view where we actually have a fair amount of control over Iranian nuclear programs, at least for the the next 10 to 15 years, which gives us time to come up with something else, and then that we would maybe shift away to a much less stable situation. Yeah, and then we have, you know, I think one of the selling points that I heard amongst even the intelligence community for the JCPOA is, it's one of the most intrusive regimes that you know has ever been designed. Uh, the IAEA, IAEA has access; it should decide that it's it's warranted, uh, even to military facilities. So, 
Uh, it just, yeah, it seems like it's baffling why we'd want to open up a new uh, crisis front when we've got, you know, a very real one in North Korea. I mean, especially because it's a similar problem set, but also, you know, the the our actors that we'd have to pull in to try to make this, uh, you know, uh, regime work are the same ones that we're going to need to rely on for North Korea as well. You know, those allies actually were were really pretty cheesed off by Nikki Haley's speech yesterday. Um, she, in, in her remarks, made a few oblique comments, and then she was asked a question in the Q&A. Um, and she basically said, you know, this is about American security. It's not about European security. And she didn't quite say, well, we don't care what you think. But she basically implied that. And that's really not the way to build a multilateral coalition right. to deal with a global security threat. That's the way to end up alone as everybody splits off and goes their own way. Yeah, yeah. No, America alone uh, seems to be a better tagline than America first for the Trump doctrine so far. And I think one of the things that bothers me, and and Samir, you you sort of suggested this, is very similar to the way that the the Trump White House seems incapable of understanding Washington's bandwidth when it comes to making domestic policy. Oh, we're going to get tax reform done and Obamacare reformed and we're going to do this and that. And oh, by the way, you know, I'm going to throw you this dreamers problem too. And, you know, you're like, wait, we can't even do one of those. Don't make us do four of them by a deadline. Well, foreign policy now, it looks like we're having the same problem. He can't let one fire go out before starting another. And my Lord, it's just, it's a lot to imagine them handling, especially when you realize he has no State Department. Uh, and it's not clear that he really has a really a functional national security working sort of process yet. So, I mean, it's really – it bugs me on all sorts of levels. Yeah, the personnel issue is, is a little concerning because all these situations, if we are limited in terms of coercive options and we have to – and even with coercive options, you need to have communicate effective signals through diplomats. Um, and we just seem to be short on those and we're losing them by the day. Yeah, we're missing senior administration officials that should be appointees on things like non-proliferation, right? So until they fill those posts, sort of hard to see how they come up with a policy. Mm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, so let's let's follow up that diplomacy line just a little bit and and talk about Russia for a minute. Um, Russia kicked out some Americans from from Russia, and then eventually, after thanking Putin for doing it, eventually the United States got around to kicking out some Russians. Um, uh, then the Russians went and uh, I guess had a bonfire um, or something at a couple of the uh, consulates. Uh, is is there anything real behind the recent U.S.-Russia flapping or is this just, you know, hand waving and, and, and nothing big? Well, as, as somebody who spent my graduate school career studying U.S.-Soviet relations, you know, this is actually kind of exciting for me, right? The U.S. <laughs> and the Soviet Union are expelling one another's diplomats, making the persona non grata. The Russians are at the back of the embassy burning the classified to get out of there in time. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a throwback to these sort of Cold War disputes that we had. Um, and I, I joke mostly about it being exciting, but in another way, it's it's actually quite worrying because the U.S.-Russia relationship was the one that at the start of the Trump administration, we thought maybe that could actually improve. Um, and even with all the domestic stuff, there was some potential there, but it seems to have completely gone off the rails. Um, we're in a position now where the Russians expelled a substantial chunk of the American diplomatic staff in Russia. Uh, the U.S. responded by closing this consulate and annex. Um, and the Russians seem to not be responding yet, but you could see how relations can end up even more strained. And it's not at all obvious, again, what the end game is here. And troubling because, because you know, good or bad relationship, you still would like to have Russia's help at certain tables, North Korea, uh, Iran, mm-hmm. potentially Syria. I mean, it's not like you can get away from dealing with them. Afghanistan, yeah. Afghanistan, exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's I, you know... I don't think much of any one dust up. But again, the pattern, you start to think, well, that's not – again, it doesn't look like competent handling of foreign policy. So, you know, because we've been agreeing so much thus far, I feel like I need to, you know, play devil's advocate. But, you know, it, it does seem that it, it wasn't disproportional. I mean, it was somewhat calibrated, you know, in terms of sort of tit for tat as, as you described, uh, expelling diplomats for other diplomats. Um, those are signals that you can send and then you can sort of bring the diplomats back in. And usually there's like quiet measures to sort of restore relations. But, um, you know, and the other thing is I, this is not my area of expertise, but from what I've read over the last six months or so, um, 
Russia, if it was involved in some of the activities it's accused of being involved in in terms of cyber uh, propaganda and infiltration of U.S. networks um, and electoral process, um, it's, it's to me as an American, it's a very transgressive set of acts that's committed. Uh, and you know, when we think about sort of some of the coercive measures we could take that could prompt really sort of stark reactions by states, we're always like talking about regime change. I mean, this wasn't a regime change effort necessarily, but it was regime atrophy. I mean, this is wasn't targeted just at a particular political party. It was a, undermining faith in American institutions to a degree, and that's. Worrisome, and I think you know maybe this was not necessarily the right tactic to take, but I do think that we need to take this very seriously. You know, I I don't disagree with you. I think that the the time for a discussion over Russian involvement in the election and the things that they did, th- that time was at the start the Trump administration mm-hmm. to come up with a strategy sure. for how to respond this, to this. Instead, I think what we're actually seeing now is basically what Obama did at the end of his term playing out. And this appears to be sort of the end of that process, right? This all started when the Obama administration seized a diplomatic compound in Maryland. The Trump administration just doesn't seem to have taken up that question. And perhaps that's not unsurprising considering the ongoing investigations. But, you know, I I agree with you that there needs to be some response to this. I just don't think this is either sufficient or effective. Mm. Yeah, it's not clear that they're responding to the right signal, actually. Like, it would be tit for tat if that was actually the tit we should have been tatting. If that, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> we, 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 there's this resounding silence of, you know, the actual stuff that they did right. <laughs> that we think they did. And then instead, we're going to get mad about, like, the little diplomatic shuffle. That, that seems mm. like that's some crazy stuff. Uh, all right. OK. So. Now let's ask you the surprise question of the day. Uh-oh. It's not it's not a super surprise. I, I think we might have hinted at it. Um, but we like to ask our guests to to talk a little bit about uh, threats uh, and in particular uh, hyped and unhyped. So t- tell us what you think is the most overhyped threat that people are talking about today. Hmm, that's tough for me. You know, I, I think I think there's probably sort of a couple of them. Are there. And generally, it's sort of the category of non-state actors, to me, I think it's overhyped a lot in the United States. I mean, there was certainly a set of non-state actors that committed one of the most heinous acts on U.S. soil uh, a little more than 15 years ago. But I think we tend to overinflate both capability, intention, and reach, and scale of these groups. Um, so, you know, I'm sure we'll get, get to this in our discussion on Afghanistan, but we routinely cite uh, that there are 20 terrorist organizations sort of floating around in Afghanistan and Pakistan. But we never really talk about whether those groups are actually direct threats to the U.S. homeland, which is the ostensible reason why we are uh, still remaining in Afghanistan. So do they have the intention uh, and like in terms of serious, like, you know, clear intention of this and the capability to strike the U.S. homeland? And I don't know if anyone's done sort of a serious analysis. I assume the IC has, but I don't know in the public domain if I've really seen people unpack this. Or for that matter, I haven't seen anyone even try to enumerate these 20 groups. I mean, I've, I've spent some time myself doing this, so now I know. But uh, yeah, it's, it's just baffling that we sort of like hang on to this. And then this is justification for maintaining America's longest war without at least tackling that question. Right on. Right on. All right. And so what's the actual biggest threat facing the United States? <sighs> That's and, tough and do we take it seriously enough? Mm. So again, this is probably speaking from ignorance, but I have been uh, surprised at the level of uh, threats that are vulnerabilities the United States uh, betrays when it comes to um, cyber vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, And now I don't think that's an underrepresented threat in the United States. I think there's certainly a lot of people playing it up and and potentially hyping it. But it's one that may be be underappreciated, particularly um, from American citizens, because the, the ability to permeate or penetrate U.S. networks, not just like a hardened secure networks, but also even everyday uh, functions of American society seem actually quite quite vulnerable. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting answer, actually, because I think you're right. I think we talk about it a lot, but I don't think people really understand what it is, appreciate what the risks really are. And to be frank, it's not always clear to me that policymakers take the real risks seriously right. as opposed to the sort of fake risks, yeah, the yeah. Uh, cyber Pearl Harbor right, risk. Right, right. We don't even know what we're talking about yet. That's uh, yeah. the unknown unknowns, I guess you might say. Right. All right. Okay. Let's let's pivot to to our big topic of the day, and that's Afghanistan. Uh, so, for, first question for you is: you know, here's a president who spent years before he got into the White House criticizing the war in Afghanistan and nation building, a total failure. Says we should get out, and now his big his first national primetime TV address. He says we're staying. 
and we're going to do a little bit of a surge. What made him change his mind? I think that's that's probably going to be the subject of, of someone or many books uh, in the future because, yeah, the, all the signals seem to be leaning towards – uh, something dramatic, something a dramatic change, whether withdrawal or private contractors or something like that. I mean, but then there were signs uh, as the, the the composition of the administration was changing when Steve Bannon was out. That certainly gave an upper hand to um, General Kelly, General Matheson, uh, uh, General McMaster, uh, who seemed to be in line on a position of you know escalating at least U.S. troop commitments and the duration of our commitments to Afghanistan. So, uh, I mean, I think you could say sort of this is like an internal, whether it's bureaucratic or sort of internal. Uh, leadership shift that probably then tilted the president's hand. But, you know, I think there are a couple, like, there's like there's good sort of strategic reasons you could make a case for and, and political reasons, right? So on the political side, uh, you know, I think this president has been associated, if, if there's any word the president sort of associates himself with, it's winning, right? And the notion that by withdrawing from Afghanistan for accepting sort of the deterioration of the status quo and the the, the, the uh, resilience or resurgence of the Taliban would be constitute losing. I think that was very hard for this president to be associated with. And I also think that there's a recent uh, memory, at least in Washington, D.C. I'm not sure if this carried throughout the rest of the country, but certainly in Washington and uh, with the military that, you know, the withdrawal from Iraq uh, is then now associated with the rise of ISIS and some, again, some pretty terrible things that have occurred in the last three, four years. Um, so that hanging... The ability for anyone to hang that around the president's neck after, if, if we were to withdraw from Afghanistan, the risk of that happening, I think, is a deep sort of political problem for, for him, re-electoral concerns for, for the Republican Party. Um, but then there's, there are strategic arguments for why you would actually want to be uh, wary of withdrawing from Afghanistan or changing – dramatically changing the system. And that is that it is possible that uh, a situation that was similar to immediately prior to 9-11 could reconstitute itself. It could be a series of – uh, endless civil wars that creates a lot of space for non-state actors to potentially plot and perpetrate attacks against uh, the U.S. and or its allies. I'm not saying – no, I think that has to be evaluated in terms of the probabilities of that and the risk of that relative to the costs of an enduring operation. But I think that is ultimately what probably won the day is that people placed a high uh, risk of that. Um, so, the, so the safe havens argument basically. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I, I pulled – a. Barry Posen's uh, um, sources of military doctrine because it, it reminded me of something that – and this is like a common theme through all these topics we've been talking about, whether North Korea or Iran um, or Afghanistan, is that we're living in sort of this age of uncertainty. And if we want to rely on a strategy of deterrence, uh, whether with a state actor or a non-state actor in terms of you know being able to try to deter or disrupt terrorist uh, threats coming from Afghanistan and posing a threat to the U.S. homeland, uh, that's – a lot less comfortable for, particularly for militaries, right, who are, who are trained in or to prefer the offensive, right? The, I think the line that I wanted to read from Barry's book is, um, offensive operations are elaborate combinations of forces and stratagems, more art than science. Denial is more straightforward and punishment is the simplest of all. From specialists in victory, defense turns soldiers into specialists in attrition and deterrence makes them specialists in slaughter. So, if you're a strategist, if you're a military leader, you want to be a specialist in victory. Uh, and so it's hard to cede that ground to uncertainty and deterrence. That's a really great quote. And I, th- I think in the context of Afghanistan, it really sets the stage because we are talking about uh, Trump being advised by a cabinet, by White House advisors that are predominantly military men um, in, in sort of the higher reaches of his advisors. And these are people who themselves have deep experience with particularly Iraq, but also with Afghanistan. And so they see this as a military operation. They want to use military tools to resolve it. But it's not necessarily a, a military problem to solve. And as you say, you know, assessing the actual risks might give you a somewhat different outcome than just accepting that there are risks. Yeah, this is this is really interesting. And Samir, I think you outlined a bunch of good hypotheses for that future book author to to take up. Uh, people are policy. That's one notion. Um, another one is the, sort of the, the offensive bias of the military. Another one I'd throw on that pile, sort of a cousin to that one, is the fact that sort of as Emma suggested, not only do these guys have a lot of experience there, but this is where um, they, they are deeply psychologically committed 
to victory and to not losing. Like yeah. those are two different things. Yeah. But to yeah. not admitting everything I did for the past 16 years is is out the window and was actually a big counterproductive waste of time, which some of us might believe. Mm. Um, that's that's a hard thing to get somebody to say. And so, and then you toss on that all the electoral concerns that Trump obviously has, and how do you, how do you play this? Doesn't want to be the president to lose Afghanistan. Right. And so I, you know, there there are. I, and the, 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 those are all great arguments about what might have driven Trump to make this decision. I'm just not sure which one weighed most heavily in his mind. Um, I have this sense that the winning and losing thing, however it was, however it was weaseled into the conversation, was was maybe the because he doesn't seem like a guy who reads the fine details yeah, too yeah. much, like the strategic calculation. Really, does he yeah. pay that much attention to that? If I wanted to convince him, I think that was that would how I would sell it. You wouldn't that, you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Trump did, however, try and put his own sort of stamp on this, I think. You know, he gave that speech in which he talked about, um, you know, we're abandoning nation building, um, even, even though we don't actually really seem to be abandoning nation building. He said, that's what we're doing. We're focusing on the military options. He called it principled realism, which for anyone that's ever studied realism, that's a very strange definition. You know, but Trump seemed to be implying in this speech that there is something new, that this strategy would be a break from the past, a break from what the Obama administration was doing. Is it actually a break from that past policy? Yeah, you know, uh, so within a few days, there was a briefing that I attended uh, with, it was off the record with senior officials. uh, And, you know, before even hearing from them, I just talked to some other former officials who've been affiliated with uh, US strategy in Afghanistan for a while. And I just posed the question, are we really abandoning nation building? They were like, no, this is exactly what nation building is, right? And I think the way the Trump administration has framed it, and they have like strong incentives politically to dis- dissociate themselves from past strategies, but the framing has been that they're going to focus on priority reforms, right? and this is part of the Kabul compact. So governance, economics, peace process, and security reforms, right? Well, that if you're if you're, I don't know what is outside of state building if you're uh, beyond governance, economics, and sort of security sector reform. I and mean, there are probably a few things uh, that might be sort of outside of it, but those are the core challenges. And I think as long as long as we're sort of using that as barometers for uh, success in order to decide when we hand off this problem to the Afghans themselves, uh, we're in the business of state building. So still nation building, that's not new. We're going to give it a new name, of course, sexier, you know, but still nation building. Uh, we're going to send, it looks like maybe another 3,500 troops. That's not new. It doesn't sound like. Um, Trump did, however, mention uh, Pakistan and even India mm-hmm. uh, as part of a broader South Asia strategic approach to dealing with Afghanistan. And and that smells new. Mm-hmm. Samir, is that really new or is that just more uh, marketing? Well, the India side, I think, is a little is a little newer. The Pakistan side, a little less so. But then again, the devil is always in the details. So on the Pakistan side, um, multiple actors, uh, multiple administrations, Bush administration and the Obama administration, uh, tried very hard to alter Pakistan's strategic calculus through a combination of carrots and sticks, incentives and uh, uh, and threats or actual uh, pressure applied, uh, and none of it seemed to work. And ultimately, the 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 I think everyone in this process would agree that one of the primary problems in Afghanistan, not the sole one, but one of the primary ones is the access to safe havens of uh, the Taliban insurgency. Uh, And most research on counterinsurgency finds that if you can't cut off sort of access to those safe havens, you're more than likely to lose. So the U.S. knows that's the critical, one of the critical problems, uh, but it doesn't really seem to have a good solution to it. So we have a a toolkit of coercive levers we're going to probably uh, trot out over the next uh, few months, maybe some private, some publicly, but they're, most of them are familiar. Most of them are about, you know, cutting aid or access to military hardware or, um, you know, increase, ratcheting up strikes uh, I, uh, like or independently on uh, believed t- Taliban, you know, uh, leadership targets uh, within Pakistan potentially. Um, there's some talk of uh, targeted sanctions. Uh, but all these have either limits or downsides, and there's a there's a range of things that Pakistan could do, uh, let's say, to retaliate. Essentially, um, ranging from cutting off access to the a uh, the air lines communication, the ground lines communication, to um, being a little more uh, lenient when it comes to the freedom of operation of some of these actors. Uh, it's been sort of a partner on intelligence and counterterrorism cooperation on a variety of fronts, um, and it could start to be less of an actor on that. Uh, so there's there's a variety of responses they have, I and mean, I think 
one of the best articles I saw on this was my colleague Chris Clary wrote one um, for War on the Rocks in the series that we've been running with at Stimson uh, and War on the Rocks on uh, looking at sort of the balance of U.S. interests with the Pakistan and uh, what are the costs to sort of going down this road. And the costs seem pretty, pretty high uh, for, again, a return that's unclear. Yeah, you know, that is interesting you mentioned that article because I have to say that that article by by Christopher Clary was actually one of the best that I have read on this topic. Um, and I don't remember if it was him or indeed if it was it was you, Samir, who wrote an article recently in which you, in which which said basically the downsides for pressuring Pakistan could be really big. And Pakistan is always going to be more important for U.S. interests than what we get out of them in Afghanistan. And I, I thought that was just a really interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, the thing that boggles my mind a bit is, you know, we sort of own Afghanistan in a certain sense. I mean, we're sitting there. We're the kingmaker there. We provide all the security. We have maximum leverage. And look how difficult it is to get things done. Yeah. Now imagine trying to produce anything like that kind of leverage over Pakistan where you don't have any of that going for you. And in fact, they have all sorts of interests in not going along with what it is you want. I'm trying to figure out what the theory of victory is Mm. there. Or again, I'm tempted to think this is just more marketing. Really, they're not going to try this hard to pressure Pakistan. They're going to make a few symbolic gestures and then call it a day and Mm. let the next president deal with it. I mean, I hate to be cynical, but... The, the point you raise actually I think is one of the more important ones that I think has been neglected, at least in sort of talking points in this discussion, which is most of the problem has been framed as how do we get Pakistan to change its behavior. But I think we're really in a pivotal deterrence problem where we also have uh, the Kabul government and the Afghan side that we are trying to incentivize or pressure into changing their behavior. And that's mostly po- on the political side. It's about sort of implementing a set of reforms that actually will produce military effectiveness or produce effective governance. Uh, and we haven't been – we don't really have any – a toolkit or we haven't even talked through a toolkit of how we incent and or pressure. It seems to only be unidirectional, only about incentives. And I think the one area where the administration has said it's very distinct from past policies is that we have committed uh, not to a timeline but to a sort of an indefinite commitment until um, we see conditions on the ground change. But the downside to that, it's a moral hazard problem. We've now given carte blanche to the Afghan government that we are never going to leave until you are safe. And so they have either perverse incentives to sort of maintain the system as is because they get a lot of goodies out of it, or it's certainly not enough fire under them to really be motivated to make either domestic changes or to be willing to move towards a a political process, which has also been a hang up in Kabul too. It's a political signal to other states too. So Mm -hmm. we, we were talking about this in the context of Southeast Asia, but there are other states involved here. Russia has been sort of stepping up its engagement with the Taliban. Um, Iran has been getting increasingly involved in Afghanistan. China is expressing more interest. And these states aren't necessarily, they don't want the same things the US wants. Some In some places, they're actually working against us. And we have just sent a signal basically saying that we will be in Afghanistan for many years. You know, you can work against us there. If there are security concerns you have, maybe the US will deal with those for you. And so again, I just don't think this is a good signal mm-hmm. that we're sending that it's an indefinite commitment. Yeah. And and also, I just, to go back to the safe havens strategic argument that may or may not have tipped the balance for Trump, um, Afghanistan is only one of several places and not even the best place to worry about safe havens if that's actually what you're worried about. Yeah. And so the last thing I want is for them to get that idea in their head that they need to go solve that problem in all the other places right. where you could argue that, well, Libya's pretty full of, of, of you know, spaces that are uncontested. And, oh, by the way, so is Somalia. And, you know, hey, tidbits of Egypt and Morocco are mm-hmm. looking pretty bad. I mean, where do you stop with that theory? Yeah. And, and frankly, you know, if you do some analysis, and this is it's funny, I have my students in a security policy course at Mason uh, do this exercise. We take the State Department's foreign terrorist organization list, and we actually do a threat matrix. Oh, interesting. And, and you assign points on, you know, various dimensions of scariness to the U.S. And one of the things you have to start off with is, do they actually have an uh, explicit anti-U.S. mission. And it turns out that most of them don't, mm. of course. And that decrements the fear level right away. They've never attacked U.S. interests and they don't – that's not their point. And so why why are you romper stomping around the world worrying about safe havens when the groups that are in those havens don't care about the United States? But yet that seems to be what we're up to in the war on terror in general. So I think Afghanistan is unfortunately a, a terrible template for U.S. foreign policy. 
you know, the you had brought up India earlier. I think that is another point that we're worth discussing briefly, and that is. Uh, I think the Trump administration was trying to sort of make this a broad South Asia policy by bringing India into the conversation, whereas the Obama, Obama administration distinctly called it the AFPAC strategy. But it's unclear to me what India's role really is. It's either that India will sort of continue to do what it has been doing, which is sort of play this economic uh, you know, investor in Afghanistan and have probably some – it has linkages with the intelligence agencies, uh, the NDS in Afghanistan. Um, or it might be a prelude to India stepping up its efforts maybe into more in the security sector domain uh, as a trainer, as potentially participants, um, which is either being levied as a threat to induce Pakistan to play a different game uh, or actually genuinely asking the Indians to step up and play this role. And I don't think know if we've really spent some time asking the Indians how serious they are about this, how willing they are and what capabilities they actually have to do this to project force uh, across, you know, over – over airspace because they don't actually have a border shared with Afghanistan. So they'd be either deploying trainers and have to think about force protection, logistics and all this stuff. And I don't think India is really even close to being there. And more importantly, because in the Trump administration, the Trump's uh, President Trump's speech, he referred to the Indo-Pacific, uh, which is clearly a stop to the Indians because the idea is that this is not just um, – you know, the Asia Pacific, that, that it's the way we sort of can't like uh, genuflect that we have this strong relationship with India. Um, but the, the whole point of the strategy of building up India to balance China is ultimately about focusing on the maritime domain. And by inviting or trying to push India into to a land war in Asia uh, is probably not in our bet. Even if we thought that sort of India is sort of the future for our balancing strategy against China, that's not the way to do it. You actually want India to be much more focused on its naval development and its maritime security uh, to, to balance China's you know, potential uh, uh, threats to the, the Indian Ocean than you do in terms of funneling them into uh, an endless war in, in uh, Central Asia. The question that I actually really had about this, and you, you kind of touched on it a little, but it, it seems to me that Pakistan would probably view India being more heavily involved in Afghanistan as a security threat to them, right, which could actually exacerbate some of these existing pathologies. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if that's the case, in, in addition to all the reasons you outline, it's not at all clear to me why we would want to draw India further into the conflicts in Afghanistan rather than working with them on issues that would actually be more effective. Yeah, well, it could be a coercion strategy. I mean, which I think it partly is, is trying to levy this threat in order to get Pakistan to, to shift its approach. Uh, but that has to have some teeth. And I just don't think it does because I don't think India is actually going to fill that role. And at the same time, it does play to Pakistan's worst fears, which is this, this fear of encirclement between India and Afghanistan, which then leads Pakistan to a set of behaviors that I think is also a reason why we're very concerned, which is sort of the nuclear risks that exist in Pakistan, right? If you want to in, ratchet up pressure on Pakistan by putting India in the mix, that means that Pakistan has to rely more on asymmetric nuclear strategy, which means uh, taking riskier uh, chances in terms of uh, – uh, tactical nuclear weapons, smaller weapons, higher state of readiness, lower thresholds in order to offset what will sort of be its a diminished conventional capability against a two-side, two-front threat. So ultimately, that also seems to be working against our broader interest in the region. I'm not, I'm not sure we've circled that square yet. Yeah, perhaps this is a, a logical lead-in to our, our quick last question, which is basically, what do you see actually coming out of this new strategy? What are the implications? What are the implications for Afghanistan, for us here at home in the US? Um, is anything going to change? You know, it's a fool who tries to predict the future and a really dumb fool who tries to guess what Trump will do. So who knows? But, you know, if I, if I had to bet, my best bet would be that there will be very little change uh, in terms of the facts on the ground between now and the end of Trump's first term. Um, you know, presumably a few more American forces will change the, you know, 60-40 to a 70-30 split in terms of districts controlled between the Afghanistan and the Taliban. But, but you know, does it erase the threat of the Taliban? No. Does it sort of miraculously let the United States leave happily? No. I can't see that. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that you could imagine some near-term gains. I think U.S. forces deployed there will help uh, tactically maybe uh, both retake some some terrain and hold some terrain a little bit better. Uh, and that's probably because of U.S. air power more than anything else. Um, but I don't see a fundamental shift on the ground. It doesn't seem like we're going to get Pakistan to change this game. Uh, I'll just use another line that Chris had in his, uh, his article. In, in a game of brinksmanship with Pakistan, Pakistan's not bluffing. They actually have a very good hand. 
And so I think we'll, we'll be hard pressed to really change their behavior and then um, we're sort of back to square one, but maybe at a worse state in our relationship, which makes it harder for other, other things that we care about. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Power Problems, and a thanks to Samir Lawani for being part of the discussion. Please connect with us on social media by using the hashtag FPPowerProblems. You can find more information about Cato at Cato.org. As always, this episode was produced by Jeff Geld. Have a great day.